Well, turn, if you would, to Paul's epistle to the Galatians. Galatians chapter number 1. It is my, I'm going to say humble opinion, that Galatians of the 66 books slash letters that gospels that we have in our Bible. I'm, I'm, my opinion, Galatians is the most misunderstood and probably the most mistaught. Uh, Hebrews is pretty close to it. My prayer is that by the time we get through these six chapters, uh, you will have a, a firm understanding of this letter. And maybe perhaps you've studied Galatians before. You studied at it with a, a, a maybe a different perspective. And if you did, then I think this series is going to be rather an eye-opening uh, event for you. And I'm, and I'm glad for that. The author is Paul. Uh, very few uh, would dispute su uh, something like that. But Paul, Shaul, uh, was a Pharisee, a very well-learned one under Gamaliel. I've said before, my again, I, I think of, of all the apostles, he was the most learned of them all. Uh, he had a firm, firm command on the Tanakh, what is commonly referred to as the Old Testament. A firm command of the Tanakh. And he also had a, a firm understanding of Roman culture. And so of, of any apostle, by far, he is the most qualified to write a letter like this. Uh, I will tell you this, it's, it's rather interesting. I've, I've heard it plenty of times. People have, have said, you've probably heard it taught there. Um, when, when Saul, the Pharisee, when he, when he came to faith on that Damascus road, he changed his name to Paul. That is not true. Shaul is his Hebrew name, and he was born Shaul, and he died Shaul. Uh, but Shaul, uh, in the Greek, what you see as far as uh, the Greek language goes, his name would be Saulus. Saulus. Keep in mind that Shaul had Roman citizenship. And when you had Roman citizenship, the Romans gave you another name. And so his name, his Latin name, and it's probably a nickname, was Paulus, where we get the English Paul. So Shaul never changed his name when he got saved. Paul, or is the English of Paulus, which was his Latin name. And his Latin name because, as I said, he had Roman citizenship. Paul was, of, and I'm going to use paint with a very broad brush here, of, uh, of an ultra-Orthodox sect of Pharisaical Judaism. And again, I'm, I'm painting with a broad brush when I say Judaism, because there was a number of Judaisms during the Second Temple period. But it was this ultra-Orthodox sect of Pharisaical Judaism, which taught that righteousness was attained. It was attained, not by grace through faith, but by the works of the Torah, and most importantly, your ethnic status. Your ethnic status. It was common knowledge, common, uh, uh, well-known term or phrase at the time. Uh, all Israel has a place in the Olam Haba, or the world to come. All Israel has a place in the world to come. Now, there is, a, there is truth to that, depending on how you define Israel. And so let's define Israel quickly. If I just gave you the word Israel, and I asked you to define it, that would be impossible, because I didn't give, it, I didn't give you the word in its context. So if I say, you know, I, I hopped on a plane, and I flew to Israel, well, obviously I'm talking about the land. But if I said, and Israel had 12 sons, and Reuben was his first, well, now I'm talking about a man. I'm talking about Jacob. If I mention, and God spoke to or, or, uh, the house of Israel, that's an ethnic term. Now I'm, now I'm referring to the Hebrew people, what we commonly refer to as the Jewish people. But then there's a term, and you see it oftentimes in your Bible, and it's in the Hebrew, it's B'nai Yisrael. B'nai Yisrael which, 
depending on your version of scripture, is translated into sons of Israel or children of Israel. Children of Israel being uh, a better translation. And what does that mean? That means everything. And the children of Israel shall keep the Shabbat, observing it throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant, right? When you hear that term, that Hebraic term, B'nai Israel, that term is referring to exactly what Paul is speaking about in his letter to the Romans when he's talking about the olive tree. You're talking about an olive tree, you're talking about Israel. Israel is made up of what? Branches. Natural branches, grafted in wild branches. The children of Israel. And so you have two different kinds of branches. You have branches, natural branches, that were on the olive tree from the start. But, because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, those natural branches are broken off by sin. But when someone comes to faith in a risen Messiah, those natural branches are now grafted back onto the original olive tree. But the mystery of the gospel is that it's not only natural branches that are grafted onto that tree. It's wild branches. Wild branches that were a never part of the tree to begin with. And so you have this Gentile inclusion, and that plays a big part in this letter to Galatians. Big part. So where we're talking about Israel, we're talking about the children of Israel, we are talking about born-again believers. It doesn't matter how you're born, it only matters if you're born again. So, unbelieving Judaism, which was coming out of the, th out of the Second Temple, was teaching that Gentiles, and I'm referring to that in its ethnic term, because oftentimes Gentiles can be referred, or, or is referring to pagans, heathens, and so on. But unbelieving Judaism was teaching that Gentiles, non-Hebrews, do not have a place in the world to come. They do not have a place in the Olam Haba, but, but, if you go through a conversion process, if you go through A, B, C, D, if you pledge your allegiance to the Torah, if you get circumcised, if you bring an offering to the, to the temple, if you, do, if you do A, B, if you check off all the boxes, you're no longer a Gentile, you're a Jew. And so you may have started off Haitian or Jamaican or German or Russian or Polish or Italian or Chinese. But no, after you go this, through this conversion process, you are no longer a Gentile anymore. You're Jewish. And that's nonsense. Of course, we know that. But that's what was being taught. In fact, Chabad teaches that to this day. You can go to the Chabad synagogue and go through a conversion process. It's, it's, it's not free. You've got to plunk down a whole lot of money to do it. But they will, they will, you can go right through, the, through this process, and you come out on the other end, and hey, you're no longer a Gentile anymore. You're a Jew. Okay. So that false teaching, you can call it the adulteration of the gospel, had now crept its way into the Galatian assembly. Paul gets word of this, and he sits down and he writes this letter. So let's begin. Chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not sent from men, nor through the agency of men, but through Yeshua the Messiah and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me, to the congregations of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Yeshua the Messiah, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. So, the letter is being written by Paul, who is an apostle. So let's, let's take a look briefly at that term. There were, obviously you have the original 12. Uh, Judas is the son of perdition, right? He is uh, replaced in Acts chapter 1, Matthias, right? As, as they, they cast lots and it falls upon Matthias. Those are your 12. Paul would be the 13th apostle. Barnabas, as you'll see, would be the 14th apostle. And I believe personally, I think there's enough evidence that we have in the scriptures that James, the, the brother of Yeshua, is an apostle as well, and he's the 15th apostle. 
So, I will tell you this. The office of apostle. That office has come to a close. When John wrote his, or Yeshua's, revelation, and John breathed his last, that was the end of that office of the apostle. Now, that might come as a shock to many, because there are a number uh, of people, they're out on YouTube, they're walking around Palm Beach County, and they're claiming the name apostle. I'm apostle this, and I'm apostle uh, John Smith, and I'm Apostle Tom Brown, and I'm Apostle, 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 and I'm here to tell you that they're charlatans. You cannot assume that title, nor can anybody just give you that title. An Apostle, an Apostle saw the risen Yeshua with his own eyes. That's an Apostle. An Apostle was given miraculous powers to raise the dead, so the next time somebody comes to you and claims to be an apostle, you say, really, when was the last person you raised from the dead? They could raise the dead. They were able to heal the sick. And I'm not talking about, oh, I got a migraine. Okay, let me hit you in the head. And okay, no, man, it's gone now. No, no, I'm talking about like authentic healings that could be seen and verified. They, they, could, they could actually heal people. They could actually exercise demons out of people. These were apostles, okay? And it, they didn't claim that title, and it wasn't given to them by somebody else. It was Yeshua himself who gave them that title. Even Matthias in Acts 1, the lot that was cast, the lots are cast, but it's the Lord that goes ahead and made that decision. So every apostle is an apostle because Yeshua said he's the apostle. So what does that make all of us? As believers, we are disciples. We are disciples of the risen Savior. The other problem that I would have with anybody calling himself an apostle is this. I would ask this question. If you're an apostle, well then, if anybody can just call themselves an apostle, then why didn't Luke call himself an apostle? I mean, Luke, if you, if you sat down and you actually counted words, believe it or not, Luke more, wrote more of the New Testament than Paul. When you factor in his gospel and the book of Acts... He wrote more of the New Testament than anybody else, and he doesn't call himself an apostle. How about Mark? Mark didn't call himself an apostle, and he wrote the first gospel. Matthew took Mark's gospel and then added on to it. So, an apostle's authority, that designation, came directly from Yeshua himself. So, Paul is letting you know, I'm an apostle, and it's Yeshua who sent me. It is the risen Savior. He says, I'm not sent from men, nor through the agency of man. So he's letting, the, he's letting you and I know, and he's letting his audience know. It's not like the other apostle sent me. It's not as if some board of directors sent me. He got sent. He is on this missionary trip and this journey because Yeshua sent him. He's an apostle. And so he's sitting down, he's writing this letter to who? To the congregations of Galatia. The Galatian people were, in the first century, the, 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 they were Celtic people. They were Celtic people. The Romans had conquered these Celtic people back in the, in the year 189 before the Common Era. They migrated from, I believe the, how you pronounce it, is Gaul, uh, which is modern-day France. That was in the 3rd century. 3rd century. Galatia became a Roman province in the year 25 of this common era. So, if Galatia became a Roman province in 25, we're probably looking at Paul sitting down and writing this letter somewhere around the year 49, 50, 51. Somewhere around in there. So, it's not as if Galatia as a province was around all that long. A couple decades. So, you... you as far as trying to figure out um, where chronologically it fits in our Bible, you have Acts 13, you have Acts 14, uh, Paul and Barnabas, who, are, who is also called an apostle there. They go to Antioch, they go to Iconium, they go to Lystra, they go to Derbe, right? And then you have Acts chapter 15, the Jerusalem Council. Uh, most historians believe... 
right after Acts 15 and that Jerusalem Council, right after that, that's when Paul sits down and writes this letter. If it's not at, right after Acts 15, it, then it's right before it, but most historians will say it's right after Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council. He sits down and he writes this letter. And he writes this epistle to the home congregation, and I think with the hopes that they would take it and also circulate this letter or copy the letter and send it out to other congregations uh, in the Galatian region. So, verse 3, he says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Yeshua the Messiah. Lord, Lord. The Greek word here is kurios. And that is an interesting word, can mean master, can mean Lord. But what is interesting is that when the writers of the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Tanakh, of the Hebrew Scriptures, they sat down, they took the Tanakh, and they translated it into Greek, what is known as the Septuagint. Every time those translators came to the Tetragrammaton, in the Hebrew, the, the four-letter name of God, yod heh vav -Heh, every time they came to it, in the Greek, you will see kurios. So they make no mistake in the Septuagint as understanding that God, yod heh vav -Heh, is kurios. So when Paul sits down and he uses the same term, what's he saying? He's not simply calling Yeshua master. He is calling him, he is calling him God. And Paul understood by using this term, and he wasn't the only one, uh, of course, in the scriptures to use that word kurios when referring to Yeshua. But he is making it very clear to you and me and to his audience, Yeshua is Emmanuel. He is God with us. And he uses the term kurios. Very important. Verse 6. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Messiah for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Messiah. Okay. God had made a covenant with Abraham. Through you, Abraham. It's a unilateral covenant, not a bilateral, unilateral. I am going to, I am going to do this through you. I'm going to take you I'm going to bless you, and from you, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. The Abrahamic covenant. Paul understands that. Now, now we, by this time, he understands that. He understands the olive tree. He understands what that Abrahamic covenant really meant. It wasn't just a land covenant with the Hebrew people, although that has a part to play in it. He understands, he understands the olive tree, he understands there are natural branches that were originally broken off, like himself, and grafted back on when he got saved. And he also understands that that olive tree consists of wild grafted in branches. And so that is the Abrahamic covenant, right? All the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And that is why it's such a blessing for those of us who are saved and we know we're born again, each and every one of us can call Abraham father. Each and every one of us. So we, we've all been adopted into the family of God, and Paul understands that. He understands the gospel. It's not, it's, not just, it's not just the Hebrew people that have that inside track. They're the ones with, with the whole pass. No. No. It, the, the gospel, the mystery of the gospel, extends out to wild branches as well. Now, Galatians, I can't believe you are deserting that very salvific message that saw you come to faith. How could you be deserting that? You're deserting, Paul is saying, you're deserting the gospel for a gospel. Which is not even a gospel. Because he says it. You're going for a different gospel which is really not another, because there's only one way. How could, how could you be so foolish? <laughs> how could you be so foolish to let these troublemakers come in and try to tell you that, okay, that there's, some, there's something else that you have to do? 
that it's something more than salvation by grace through faith. How could you do that? How could you allow these charlatans, these false teachers, to slither into your garden and teach you a lie? That there's some other way to get and, and enter into a covenantal status with God. How could you have done, how could you do this? I'm amazed that you so quickly deserted him. Verse 8. But even if we, he's speaking about apostles. So those that God picked, those he, he God himself gave me this title. There's not a whole lot of us. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to that, to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. So if anybody comes to you, comes into your home, comes into your congregation, comes into your church, and tells you that salvation is not by grace through faith, that you have to go through some kind of conversion process, that you being a Galatian, it just isn't good enough. If, if someone walks in, even if it's an angel above, an angel that comes from heaven, if someone, if any person or even an angel happens to walk into your congregation and tell you such a lie, Paul is saying, then that person or that angel deserves to go to hell. They deserve to go to hell. He is to be accursed. And then let's reiterate this. Verse 9. As we have said before, so I say again now. If any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you receive, he is to be accursed. So Paul is saying, if I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times. The gospel that we preach to you, the shed blood of Yeshua there on Calvary, on that mount, that gospel message, that good news extends not only to the Jew, but to the Gentile as well. And anybody that comes and tells you something else, they're deserving of hellfire. They're deserving of it. So you see, this is a serious, serious business that we're talking about. It is one thing when you are ignorant of the gospel. There are a lot of people that are ignorant of the gospel. That's bad enough. But when someone comes and teaches you, teaches you that there's some other way, that there's some other method, that there's some other prophet, that there's some other book, if someone teaches you another way, then guess what? That person, or even an angel above, deserves to go to hell. They deserve it. They've earned it. Verse 10. For am I now seeking the favor of men, or of God, or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Messiah. So Paul knows his former spiritual state, that in his former state before that Damascus road, he was trying to attain a righteousness. Through works, and what he understood his ethnicity. Hey, I'm Hebrew, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, I am good to go. And in that, in that second temple, as long as you, were, you, you had Jewish blood in you, you were good to go. In fact, about the only, they would say the only Jewish person who did not have a place in the world to come, you would, you would have to basically, you would have to forsake the faith, uh, live like a heathen, live like a pagan, live like a Gentile. That would exclude you. And that was what was being taught. But as long as you're Hebrew... You, hey, you, you, you got a one-way ticket. And of course, that's a lie. But as an unbelieving Pharisee, that's what he believed. He, he knows now, he knows now, he was trying to attain a righteousness, and now that he's saved, he's clothed in Yeshua's righteousness. Before, before, he's trying to please his rabbis. He's, 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 he's the, he's the bondservant of his rabbis, He's the bondservant of Gamaliel. Now it's a whole other story. He's saved, he's born again, he is clothed in Yeshua's righteousness, and he's telling you, hey, I'm a bondservant of only one, and that's the risen Savior. I'm not a bondservant to anybody else. I'm not trying to seek the favor of anybody else. 
I'm not even trying to seek the favor of God. I don't, not that even, even he could do that, right? All my righteousness is his filthy rags. And he understands that. Verses 11 and 12. For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Yeshua the Messiah. So Paul is saved. He knows it. He knows that he's been adopted in the family of God. It has nothing to do with his ethnicity. It has nothing to do with his works. God is his father. And it's not because he was born that way. It's because he's born again. Paul understands that he has this covenantal relationship with God and he did not earn it. It has nothing to do with whatever he did. So he knows his covenantal status. He knows it's not determined by his blood, by his blood. He knows it's not determined by his parents. He knows it's not determined by a man or a council or the Sanhedrin or anything else. He has covenantal status, not because he's Jewish, but because by the grace of God. He has this covenantal status, not because he's Jewish, but because of the cross. The cross, the blood, the risen Savior. That's it. And Yeshua himself appeared to Paul on that Damascus road. And you know the story very well. <laughs> it's hard to kick against the pricks. It's hard. Why, why even bother? You know what the truth is. He knew. And that day, Shaul got saved. Born again. Born again. Not a process. Not a process. He was saved that day, right on that road. Verses 13 and 14. For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the ecclesia of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. Now, don't assume, and it's been taught numerous times by <laughs> not only believers, but even unbelievers, that Paul is forsaking Judaism, okay, quote-unquote, and he's <laughs> starting up Christianity. Uh, he's been accused of that numerous times. Couldn't be anything further from the truth. He's not abandoning Judaism, and he's not starting up something new. So, understand this. It's not as if Paul is saying, okay, all right, I got saved, I'm born again, and all that, that you know, the, the, the scriptures and Moses' Torah and everything, you know what, we're just going to do away with that because I'm new, I'm born again, I'm saved, I'm a Christian now. And so the law has been done away, and man, I can't wait because we all get a chance to you know, put up a Christmas tree and, and eat pork chops. That's not what he's saying. That's not what he's saying at all. He's talking about my former manner of life. Former manner of life, where he was, spiritually speaking, he did not understand that Abrahamic covenant. He did not understand salvation by grace through faith. He was blind. He knew his ethnicity. He knew. He certainly knew the Tanakh. He he, he could read the scriptures. He, he understood them to a certain certain extent, but not, not with eyes that were open. So now he's saved. He understands his ethnicity means nothing. It's not as if he's trying to attain some kind of status with God. Right? And he also understands now, wow, there's a Gentile inclusion. So it's not just Hebrew people. It's non-Hebrew people as well. And non-Hebrew people like Ruth. Non-Hebrew people like Rahab. Right? Non-Hebrew people can come to faith and sit at the same table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as me. So there was one time in his life prior to that Damascus Road where that was a threat. Gentile inclusion? No, the Pharisees had done their very best to build a wall or, or a fence around their faith, around, you could say, their Judaism. We're going to just build a fence. 
and, and, and it's going to protect our people, it's going to protect the Hebrew people, and everybody outside who's not Hebrew, hey, you're outside, you, there's no way you can come in unless we allow you to come in through this process. And anything, anything that would dare allow someone in to Shaul prior to his salvation, I have to destroy that. I have to destroy that. And he tried. He tried. In fact, he says, I was extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. Those, and, and we see a glimmer of that even in the Gospels, right? Uh, hey, so look at yeah the, the disciples of Yeshua they they they're not they're not washing their hands before they eat that's nowhere in the scriptures but that's what was that that's one of the fences and so you could take an apple which is obviously clean but uh oh you didn't wash your hands before you touched the apple so now you touch the apple with unwashed hands which means the apple which once was clean because you touched it with unwashed hands now it's unclean and if you eat it now you're unclean and that's what was being taught and he was he was zealous for those things he he, he relished in those ancestral traditions he loved that those traditions because in his mind Hey, this is what is separating us. This is what is separating us from them. And we're not going to let them in. Unless, unless you, you, you go ahead and, and you take that oath that you come in. And, and you can come in and you do things our way. Well then, hey, you have to do everything our way. Verses 15 and 16. But when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb, and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me, so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Let's pause there. He was set apart. Paul was chosen. And if you're saved, you've been chosen too. Right? At one point, he foreknew you. He knew exactly he was uh, exactly when he was going to uh, uh, make you, when you were going to be born. He foreknew you. He also foreknew he was going to, at some point in the future, he was going to save you. He predestined you. This is how I'm going to do it. And at some point in your life, as in mine, he called us. He called us. He gave us a gift through the Holy Spirit called faith. He called us and we answered the call. Yes, I believe. And you and I were now saved. He chooses. Jacob, Esau, twins in the womb. They had done nothing right. They had done nothing wrong. God chooses Jacob. God did not choose Esau. Why? Sovereignty. He can do whatever he wants with his creation. And, the, and Paul understands this. He said, he set me apart. From the very beginning, even though I didn't understand it, he set me apart from my mother's womb. So, when you hear somebody <laughs> say, well, you just need to find Jesus, now you understand that that's impossible. Because blind people can't find anything. At one point, I once was blind, now I see. So you cannot find Jesus. Yeshua is the one who has to find you. Yeshua is the one who comes. He's the shepherd, we're the sheep. Shepherds always go after, have to go after the sheep. When I was a kid, my mother used to say, Hey, it's time to come in. I would play outside, and I would keep playing outside. Uh, well, even after when the street lights would come on. And unless my mom said, Hey, it's time to come in, I'm staying outside. There's that one point in your life, as well as mine, where God says, it's time. It's time to come into my family. And you accepted the call. You accepted the call. Paul, you and I were called through his grace. Through his grace. It is amazing. It is amazing. His grace is amazing. We sometimes use the term grace and mercy, and we use them interchangeably, and they're really not. Grace 
is something you receive that you don't deserve. Mercy is something you don't receive that you do deserve. Grace. I am not deserving of heaven. I am not deserving of everlasting life. But that's what I'm going to experience and that's what I'm going to have. That's His grace. I do deserve hell. I do deserve eternal fire and eternal damnation and being separated from God. That's what I deserve and that's not what I'm going to get. That's His mercy. That's His mercy. I'm going to spend eternity with Yeshua. Grace. I am not going to be spending eternity in hell. That's His mercy. So, here we go. God the Father saved Paul, chose him, saved them. Why? <laughs> to preach the very gospel, the very good news. Guess what, Paul? To the very people you hate. The Gentiles. So, let's pause there at this point. And we're going to pick it up next time.